between the wisdom passed down by ancient healing traditions, anecdotal experience, and modern clinical trials, one thing is clear. Mushrooms are medicinal powerhouses. And I finally found a brand, a product, a company that I feel really aligns with all of my research and understanding when it comes to the medicinal properties of mushrooms, and that is alchemy mushrooms. They grow their mushrooms in California on organic mushroom farms. They keep the whole mushroom in their supplements, and they actually blend mycelium and fruit body in their mushroom powders and capsules to give you the best of both worlds. You can learn more at Alchemy Mushrooms. That's A-L-C-H-E-M-I, alchemymushrooms.com. Use the discount code MUSHROOMHOUR for 20% off your order. Alchemy with an I, mushrooms.com. Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on the Mushroom Hour podcast, we're joined by David Breslauer, chief scientific officer and co-founder of Bolt Threads. Bolt Threads is a company on a mission to create way better materials for a way better world, developing sustainable solutions for the apparel and beauty industries. With nature as inspiration, Bolt Threads invents and scales credible materials that put us on a path toward a more sustainable future. Bolt Threads is based in Emeryville, California, and was a fast company, most innovative company in 2019, 2018. David leads technology and innovation at Bolt, creating and incubating biomaterials for improved consumer products. His obsession with biomaterials began with graduate research on silk during his bioengineering PhD at UC Berkeley and UCSF. Now, David also has an orange belt in Krav Maga and is a great admirer of stencil graffiti. I'm excited to learn from him about the future of sustainable materials and how Bolt Threads and Milo, their mycelium material line, will play a leading role. David, thank you so much for joining us on the Mushroom Hour. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I love having you because your company has a lot of excitement around it. You know, this field of materials and the uses of mycelium is really novel. And I think it's so many people excited. Now, we could also do a podcast just on Krav Maga and stencil graffiti, which would be <laughs> fascinating. But there's going to be multiple podcasts of information here. So I'm excited to dive into it. Uh, but before we do get into it, tell us a little bit about that background. I mean, we just heard in the intro some research on silk you were doing. You know, what were some of the influences that led you into the field? of biomaterials and inspired you to be where you are today? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, back when I was at graduate school at UC Berkeley um, and I was doing my PhD in a field called microfluidics. And what one does in microfluidics is engineer microscale systems, kind of like a computer chip, but that move fluids rather than electrons and the goal is to shrink a biology lab or a chemistry lab onto a, a chip the size of, say, your, your fingernail, which sounds completely unrelated. I, I recognize yeah. that. What happened was at the time, there was a growing interest in the field of bioinspiration. Just generally, people started looking to nature, saying, what can we learn from nature and bring to engineering to make better cars, better boats, things like that. And... I was discussing materials with someone and they said, well, how does, how do spiders make silk? I thought that was just a really interesting question. How do spiders make silk? Where does that silk? You know, do you hear about these strong properties in, you know, Spider-Man, the Spider-Man movies, this lore around spider silk, <laughs> lightweight, super strong. Where, where does that come from? And I started looking into it, looking into it. And there was a bunch of uh, biological research where scientists had cut open spiders had looked at how it works turns out silk was is a in both spiders and silkworms is this complex protein that's secreted into this gland that's a really long funnel and that gland processes that that protein and that protein folds and it goes from a liquid to a solid and mm. turns into a fiber and i just thought that was the coolest thing and as a student in a lab working on microfluidic devices, it seemed 
fairly obvious to me that what I was looking at was a microfluidic system to convert this protein into a solid fiber. And that became a, an engineering challenge to me. How do I build a system to allow us to produce silk fibers in the lab without the spider? And so I started engineering a microfluidic device to microfluidically spin spider silk protein into spider silk fibers. And that is, that is the beginning. That is the launching pad. The rest is a much, there's, there's much more to that story, but that's how it all got its starts. Well, that's incredibly fascinating to think of maybe turning some kind of aqueous solution of proteins into spider silk on something the size of a microchip. I mean, kind of mind bending and yeah, really interesting place to to start a career, really. And it totally makes sense then why you get into this massive field of, of biomaterials. Um, that right away gets you into applications in the fashion industry and probably many other things. I guess as to set the table is kind of a broad question. How are biomaterials going to shape the future of material science and engineering? Because I think we hear about a lot of emerging materials, including things like graphene, really complicated, but biomaterials is this fascinating subset that I feel like is kind of exploding right now. So how is that poised to change different industries? And maybe is it? Because I pin a lot of hope on that as biomaterials or something that could lead us toward, like the intro says, that more sustainable future. Is that kind of massive change coming? Uh, do you see that? Yeah, absolutely. What what is really easy to forget is how many biomaterials we already use every day. Cotton is a biomaterial. Of course. Leather technically is leather, you know, aside from any plastic based chemistry chemistries that are infused in it, leather is a biomaterial. Wood is a biomaterial. Turns out there's tons of wonderful biomaterials out there. But in fact, there are even more if you look broadly at nature that evolution has evolved, nature has evolved, that solve a number of different niche areas that we haven't either, humans, civilization, and industry hasn't necessarily been able to harness at the large scale. And in more advanced biological engineering techniques and manufacturing allow us to, and that's, that's where we get into the basis of bolt threads. Um, but at its most fundamental, what excites me and excites us, the company, about biomaterials is thinking about the circularity therein, meaning materials that are grown from nutrients in the soil and sugars and sunlight that grow and then ultimately decay back in the soil over some useful time frame. It doesn't have to be instantaneous, but there's a circularity to that on a human time scale. Of course, one could argue that oil is circular over the millions of years time scale, but that is very detrimental to the environment. Um, you know, plastics are phenomenal for a number of uses. And part of the reason there is they're strong and light, and there's not a lot of natural or very few, if any, natural biopathways to degrade them. So they don't biodegrade particularly easily. But because they've become so abundant and cheap, and so, so, so cheap, we now use them for probably far more than we should be when considering environmental sustainability and environmental safety, because now plastics just sit and persist in the environment and persist in your body, carry chemistries around within them that they hold on to and distribute essentially everywhere through wastes and microplastics and microfibers, landfills filling up. So the, the dream is to reevaluate the materials we're using at a global scale, you know, as population continues to increase based on our knowledge of what can we harness that is already circular and is more amenable to scale than the materials we might have we might have brought to global scale already. And I mean, with Milo bolt threads leather, I think that's a perfect example. Leather is a fantastic material. Cowhide, outside of the animal concerns, the material itself is fantastic for human uses. However, global scale cultivation of livestock is tremendously 
land and water it uses a tremendous amount of land and water emits a tremendous amount of green greenhouse gases is not animal friendly so it's and and we use a lot of downstream chemistries to make the leather suitable to our purposes that aren't environmental friendly so how do we get back to a fantastic materials that serve the purpose but without being detrimental at large scale and it doesn't really get any more inspiring than thinking you know, we don't need some new futuristic, I mean, it sounds futuristic, but really you're pulling ideas from materials, biological processes that already exist. So the solutions are already right, right here in our biosphere potentially. And both threads in particular, it seems like you guys are focusing then on, I mean, as the intro said, apparel and beauty. What was the choice to really focus your solution set there? And maybe what is the current state of sustainability in those industries. You just laid out that very vivid description there for leather. What's the state of sustainability in those areas and why did you focus your solutions there? I think for us, it was an, a number of different factors that led us to focus on consumer products. You know, there's there's just a part of us, part of the founding team that we, Dan and I were very product focused and product interested. and what broadly appeals to the broadest range of people and therefore has the most impact. So there, there already was a notion that we wanted to have impact by working on things that you would sell to the average consumer, not just necessarily other scientists or specialty niche markets. So it was just that right. pull to start with. But as we started thinking when we, because we started the company based on as spider silk scientists, essentially. Mm. And we started going, well, what can we do? We, we think we can engineer protein-based fibers. That was really the how we, the very, very, very first coffee shop meetings is we think we can engineer protein-based fibers. What do we do with them? There's a number of different places. I mean, tons of different places fibers are used, but what could we use high performance or biodegradable or more sustainably made fibers for? And for what applications is it going to have the most impact? And the easiest answer was us looking, going, well, where is a protein-based fiber already used? Silk. And so we started going, well, what are the problems with silk? And when you start peeling that onion, when you pull back the curtain, you start looking at silk, you start looking at land usage. There's all sorts, you know, then, then chemistries for the silk, water usage, uh, there's a vegan concern um, from the vegan population because silk kills silkworms in the process. And we began to go broader and broader and broader as we were studying this and discovered, yes, fashion has a ton of um, challenges in terms of fast fashion and consumption and workers' rights and workers' treatments and workers' wages. There's a whole huge slew of issues around the sustainability of fashion there. Our expertise is around materials, and there's a ton of it with ton of challenges there that we felt we could actually address. And so our interest, and this was about six months into just having started the company, sitting in a lab bed, our interest suddenly became, well, fashion is using all these materials from nature that we've kind of slapped chemistries on, that we extract from animals in order to make them do things they didn't necessarily evolve to do. But we see all these red, readily available, simple solutions in nature that can be done in much more sustainable ways. Like, let's solve that problem. What can we bring to the market that addresses uh, sustainability challenges in fashion in the most beneficial, most impactful, most universally accessible ways? And so that's how that's how we we got here. Really, it was once we started looking, we couldn't we couldn't unsee what we saw. <laughs> I know you pull back the curtain mm -hmm. and inevitably there's a little bit of a scary underbelly in so many of the things we take for granted. And especially when you talk about fashion and apparel, so much of that is driven by consumer demand. So starting there, you inevitably skein out and have this huge impact. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about your co-founder, Dan Widmeyer. Was he in that same lab with you studying spider silk? Or how did this meeting of the minds come together in this coffee shop talking about, you know, creating protein-based materials you know it was so serendipitous it's almost unbelievable to be really frank i'm not like i'm very transparent about our history and very honest and sincere 
But the fact that I was working on the material science of spider silk and he was working on the molecular biology of spider silk to make bulk polymer right across the bay. He was at UCSF and I was at Berkeley. And someone said to me, hey, I know you're trying to make spider silk fibers. If you need a source of silk protein, spider silk protein from a microorganism, so that's the way to get proteins in bulk, there's someone trying to address that problem across the bay. And I, the fact that, that that turned out to be true and the fact that when we <laughs> met, we got along and hit it off and we were very complementary in our skill sets. I was very technically minded and he's a technical person as well, but he was much more oriented towards um, business and entrepreneurship where I, I now look back and realize I was well suited for that, but I didn't know at the time. So he was able to, you know, coax me into it. And right. we, we just worked out, worked very well together. That was, that's a supreme amount of, uh, of luck. And I consider myself very fortunate that that happened. And he had very natural, I was always interested in building technologies and building products. And he was very much of a CEO mindset. He's very much of a CEO leadership, macroeconomist mindset. He was, he was, you know, born to be a CEO. <laughs> and so we 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 fit together very well. I mean, in some ways, I can't I can't believe that it happened like that, but it did. Yeah, you know, it's always amazing to hear those stories of synchronicity behind a project, and you know, of course, that inevitably means that you got to do something powerful when you have that kind of connection. Right. It's like, okay, we got to do something with this. Yeah. So of course, that necessitates kind of building some kind of project. But when did? When did fungi enter this picture? Because you're starting in spider silk, fascinating, incredible. So when did fungi enter your guys' sphere of awareness? And when did you start working with fungi as a material? That's it's it's such a such an interesting story because as we were building up our capacity to make spider silk fibers, and as we were iterating with partners, trying to find the right product market fit, continuing to scale. And, and if you go online and you search for it, you see all these beautiful garments we've made with Stella McCartney, Stella McCartney and Adidas out of spider silk. We kept receiving uh, the request from our partners, like, hey, do you have a leather offer? Mm. People kept asking us, do you have a leather offer? And Dan and I had participated, you know, or we spent a lot of time going through a thought experiment of how would you make leather? if you were trying to make a more sustainable leather, like, you know, there were other companies out there with different ways of making leather. And the most obvious way based on the technology we had started with was be to take our silk protein and make a film and then try to tan it into leather. But we're just, that's not going to make the right product. Leather, if you look at a cross section of leather, it is this multi-scale hierarchy of cells and collagen from nanofibrils to microfibrils to macrofibrils that makes a sheet that bends and folds and squishes in a very, in a, in a unique way that you won't get if you just sort of extrude a sheet. And so how do you mimic that, that material? And so we kept, and there, there's all sorts of cost point issues too with that process with just using protein. And so the question always stood like, well, what, what could mimic that? And when we right. first learned about mycelium, we knew people were growing mycelium for various applications and first saw a, a piece of foam made out of mycelium because you can grow if you can, and, and various groups have been doing this. Um, you right. can grow foams if you grow your, your mushrooms in a very controlled environment, you can grow your spores, you can cause uh, aerial mycelium to grow into a foam where the mycelium just grow out into this marshmallow looking thing. And even you can find hobbyist groups online with instructions of how to do it. And you look at that and you go, or we went, you know, this is a self-assembling, self-growing natural material that, you know, is circular by nature. And it makes an intricate web of fibers at every hierarchy of scale, almost just like leather. And so we go, this is a much better way to do it than 
any of the our existing than than trying to use our approach as our, our approach to make fibers as a hammer. And we were just very comfortable with new technologies. So we started pursuing that in earnest and saying, okay, we made some samples, showed it to brand partners, and they're like, this has the qualities we are looking for. And suddenly said, okay, we know this stuff has the performance properties and aesthetic qualities of leather. We know that it grows in a couple days versus a cow that takes years to grow. There's right. a there there. Let's let's start pursuing this. And when the more samples we showed, the more excitement there was, the more demand there was. And we really we quite earnestly realized for this moment of time, a new approach to leather is the most impactful material we can bring to the industry to affect sustainable change in, in the world. And so we started started after that product and there's been more more demand than we could keep up with. <laughs> well, and were there any, I mean, what was that learning curve like for you guys in working with fungi? I mean, was mycelium something that, you know, kind of fell right into the wheelhouse of your guys' skill sets? Did you have to bring in folks that had that expertise or, or how did fungi kind of fit in into bolt threads? You know, it's for the silk, we have been working with growing fungi in large scale liquid fermentation. So the, we, we grow a fungus that secretes the silk protein. So it wasn't in, in the fermentation broth, purify the silk protein and spin it into fibers. So it's not totally unrelated. It's a, for us, we felt very comfortable with, okay, we're doing what is called solid state fermentation, growing on sawdust instead of in liquid rather than liquid fermentation. And we felt very comfortable with that. And we felt very comfortable hiring in mycologists and marrying them with process engineers as well as product developers to, to bring this technology to life. Very little of our, our team changed in the beginning. We just had added, added some mycology expertise. But quite literally, most of the, the strengths of our ability to execute on this, to ability to actually make a product out of this, was the scale-up team we developed and the product team we developed who could then say, this is what product quality needs to be, and this is how we bring, it, bring a material to large scale. The manufacturing is a very challenging piece. And with Silk, we had built up an exceptional manufacturing organization, an exceptional product organization. So what's kind of interesting, particularly relative to this podcast, is like, I'm not a mycologist. I never became a mycologist. I became a mushroom enthusiast from a material science point of view. I think right. it's so cool when you look at mushrooms, these crazy different spongy like materials that have all sorts of different properties that based off conditions that I mean, we are not even clear on as a scientific field, they can grow into all sorts of structures. Yeah. And that process you describe of aqueous fermentation, I know is used by some companies to make fungi or mycelium based meat. And so there's all these different applications from the same growing process. And I would imagine even just the metrics, you know, I had written down questions about how, what metrics are you looking for in a species of fungi to determine, you know, if it's suitable for leather or another material. I mean, that might be a wild west too, in terms of what metrics you're looking for, how you measure, I don't know if it'd be tensile strength, flexibility, you know, did you guys have to do a lot of work around just developing how you were going to codify what types of mycelium products worked and what didn't? Yeah, you know, it's what's been interesting is the metrics come from the product backwards. And so, and there are so many different strains of fungus we can explore. I mean, we could spend the rest of our lives just looking, looking many at lifetimes. fungus and exploring it all. So at some point we at some point we have to we have to cut bait. But really taking from the product backwards, what we develop assays to say, will this make a leather-like sheet depending on what aspect we're looking for, whether it's tensile strength, whether it's tear strength. There's a lot of common properties of leather and we have a, we have a huge laundry list. And so then we can take various different strains, grow them up and see how the mycelium behave. And a lot of them 
we, you know, we have a filter system or a funnel, funnel filtration where we cut off. We, you know, we put in a hundred, we can say, you know, 10 worked based on these metrics and then narrow it down. That's part of the, that's part of the tricks of the, the trade secrets, so to speak. But, um, Right, right. Well, and I, I know we're getting into this territory. Well, I always want to be careful. I don't want you to, you know, give too much away. But, you know, roughly that process you're talking about where you kind of set up a matrix, maybe, you know, based, like you said, starting with the material, what are we looking for in leather? Let's gauge everything against that. You have these assays where you're maybe picking 100 species. How many do you think you've looked at? Because, you know, estimates for fungi, are there may be as many as, you know, two to three million species. And, Depending how you define them, some people say, you know, potentially 150 million, you know, so how, how many do you guys think that your team has looked at in this quest to find the right leather? I think hundreds, but, you know, because think of it this way, because um, you can grow mycelium into a sheet and leather is such a specific material that has its properties based on a certain not molecular scale necessarily, but micro scale. So like the little fit fibers and stuff that you can practically see, like you, you could see the little pores and stuff. It's a lot of different mycelium can make the same properties. Mm. So you, you end up with more options than just one, fortunately, at that level. Versus say, if you were making, like as you see with the nutritional profiles, when you're looking at fungal-based supplements, you're looking for specific molecular compositions. So the material right. science is a little more forgiving. Right, now do any of those, even though you know at that micro molecular level, you find similarities, do different fungal species produce maybe a different quality of leather? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Some make worse, some make, some make better. <laughs> so that gives some flexibility or options in terms of materials. And then are there any processes you guys have to do? Obviously you referenced tanning leather. I would imagine there isn't necessarily a tanning process per se, but what is that like? Once you've grown out your sheet of mycelium you're going to use, it's the right strain. What are you guys doing to make it into? Because when anyone goes and looks at Milo, I mean, you see black textured, leather right. that looks exactly like leather. So what's going on after to, to give you that final real leather effect? So, you know, we, we've developed a lot of uh, dyeing chemistries because most tanning, there's a couple challenges. Most tanning supply chain and infrastructure is built around tanning leather, which one is a protein-based, largely protein-based chemistries because leather's collagen. And mycelium is is not, you know, largely chitin based, as well right. as there's a lot of toxic chemistry in the leather tanning industry. And we've been fortunate to be able to find some great partners in that space to adapt the chemistries we need for mycelium, but also just focus on on the most environmentally benign and sustainable chemistries to achieve to achieve the same leather-like look without necessarily having to go with the more toxic or without at all having to go with the more toxic chemistries like chromium, chromium-based dyeing. But there is, at this stage, you know, it kind of reminds me, I think it's analogous to the food, food space with Impossible and beyond. At this stage, what people want, what consumers demand, or most consumers, maybe not your fan base, who are more, you know, maybe mushroom passionate, everyone out there would think it'd be cool to have like a mushroom tagged mushroom leather. Most people right. want, are not yet ready for leather to not look like leather, just like consumers, the most consumers want their burger to feel like a beef based burger. So as an industry and a materials company, it's similar to food. We have to, we kind of have to fit in before we can then grow or evolve the market so that emboss that you see which is just it's just printed in that cellular structure it's just rolled in and Im imprinted in the material it mimics the cellular structure you see in hide most leathers now don't actually use the natural cellular structure they use the emboss but it's again it's sort of a the consumer sense of what leather is supposed to be i'm very curious over generations time 
will people lose interest in that because ultimately it represents skin. And right. so why does it have to be that way? So, you know, I, <laughs> what should it look like? What could it look like? It could look like a lot of things, but what is frankly, what is appealing to the consumer and what's going to get them to switch over from existing leather to a new alternative leathers. And so much of that, when you're trying to make change by presenting an alternative to consumers that's more sustainable, so much of that gets into psychology and, you know, making sure you can penetrate their initial kind of belief system, especially when you talk about mm -hmm. something like mushrooms or fungi, where most people's immediate association isn't necessarily positive. You know, sometimes it's even like a polarized, like either super positive and yes, I want everything to be mushroom or like, I hate mushrooms. People love mycelium, the term mycelium people like. Fungi, you, it's mixed because some people think of toes and fungus and bottle like negative impact bodily fungus. Some people see fungi and they hear something natural or they think, you know, in Europe, like, oh, we put fungi on our pizza. You know, it's <laughs> fungus is an interesting word. Fungi and fungus. Fungus has more negative connotation than fungi, even though they're the same. But you say right. fungus leather, but mycelium people uh, people resonate with much more much more clearly but that's what we're that's what we're using is the mycelium to make our material and so you kind of have to start there to give people what they know and gradually wean them to the point where yes they want to wave their fungus flag loud and proud whenever that is mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll move to some kind of new standard of leather into the future and when people think of fungus or fungi, you know, often what gets raised is mold. And for anyone who's an at-home mushroom grower, you know, when you start a mycelium block or you have your projects of kind of growing mushrooms at home, your mycelium can get infected in mold. Now, is that a problem for you guys? Or are you doing like a drying technique to make sure it can't get hold? There's no moisture in there or, or, you know, how are you avoiding that problem? Or is it just a non-issue? Everything except it's a non-issue. It's not. It's it's not any more of an issue than any other material for us. It's not a tremendous issue. I mean, we do deactivate the mycelium, so it's not. It doesn't continue to actively grow. It is just sort of an inert material at that point. You know, although people do like to talk to us about a future in which you have active like cultures of growing mycelium and making some sort of second skin which I can't even begin to get to speculate on the science fiction of that. But that'll take for, longer to get consumers there. We got to start with mycelium leather, exactly. and the mycelium skin. Yeah. So that's really interesting. So it's something that you guys are kind of taking steps against, but it doesn't really, it's not a specter that, that no, it's raises its big, head. It's not a big, contamination like that or molding like that. It, it's not a big issue than any more of an issue than anything else we've worked with. Fortunately, and you said the response has been really good from your existing fashion partners. And uh, my wife is really into fashion. She saw Stella McCartney. She was like, oh my, they got with, they're connected with Stella McCartney. This is going to be huge. This is the future. So you hinted at it before, but what has the response been for those, from those partners? And what kind of products now are we going to see being used with your guys' material? Part of the reason I think the response has been so, so strong is for a couple reasons. One is that rightly so, there's been a lot of push against leather from an animal rights point of view. But as time went on and, and the global recognition and acceptance of climate change became more prevalent, particularly then the 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 general acceptance and agreement that uh, greenhouse gas emissions, methane emissions by, by cows and livestock, and then land usage by livestock, which is tremendous, is a big contributor to the problem. Suddenly it became quite obvious that leather is, for most of these fashion houses, leather, leather is one of their biggest impact materials to as just free within the subset of their materials that contribute to climate change and there's no good alternatives so your alternatives are pleather which was rebranded vegan leather but is really just plastic leather and it mm. doesn't have all the same uh, attributes in terms of aesthetic and feel that natural leather does and 
you know, it's just a, it's just a different deal with the devil. You're, you're buying a petroleum based product. that's going to persist and persist in the, it's extractive and going to persist in the environment. So plastic might be worse. Yeah. yeah. You're not really, you, you are, I will admit that if you look at a life cycle assessment based on your metrics, it's based on, depending on how you choose the metrics, pleather is better than leather in terms of, again, depending on how you look at it, but it's on on a lot of metrics it's better than leather for the environment but it's still not a great great alternative for the reasons i mentioned so with all that suddenly it became you know that's why people were asking about a leather a leather a leather for from both threads and i think then when we were able we have worked so hard to build up a company and a culture and a team that understands how to deliver not just the quantitative attributes of a material meaning not just the things like oh this has a high tear strength this is a good high performance material that we often think about as engineers and scientists but all the other attributes that textile developers product developers think about does this drape well what's the smell does it have a good hand feel how does it sit on your body and we're able to show just as we did with silk silk fibers we were able to show increasing quality, increasing performance on quantitative and qualitative dimensions, and increasing supply. And people are like, wait, there's this is going to happen. So so like, if this is going to happen, and this company is going to do it. So people started clamoring to be first in line, you know, it's been it's been a long, hard road for everybody working in this space. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say we're the only people who have been trying, but we're the farthest ahead. And, you know, what does that mean in terms of scalability, because this is really appealing. I think everyone listening, yeah, I want a future based around mycelium leather. For people that are vegan like myself, it's like the holy grail. You know, I can't count the amount of times where you kind of see something you want and you realize there's leather in it and you're like, oh, do I want to, you know, so it's like this kind of holy grail in in fashion or apparel uh, materials. But what does it mean in terms of scalability? You know, how easily are you guys able to or, or do you project that you're able to meet the demand? I mean, when you talk about someone like Adidas, this could be like a global phenomenon. So what does that scaling process look like for you guys? It is shocking when you look at the numbers of how much leather is actually used in the world. So as far as I'm concerned, and as far as, as, far as Dan's concerned, as far as the company's concerned, we yeah. are in as quick of a race against time to offset the impact of leather as we could possibly be because there is so much leather used in the world we would have to we have to scale so quickly beyond beyond a feasible physical possibility to dominate that market in the next year or two and so it's like we're we're rushing as fast as human capacity and capital money allows to get there but it is not it's going to continue to accelerate. We are going to keep scaling faster and faster and faster. And, you know, soon enough to the average person, everyone's going to go, wow, you've gone so big. But relative to the entire global leather market, it's still going to be like 1% percentage point, 2% percentage point, 3, 4, as we, mm-hmm. as we grow exponentially, just because there's, there's so much, so much used around the world. Well, and then maybe uh, more illustratively, where are you guys then now in terms of kind of scale and how much you're able to produce, what kind of facility maybe? And then, yeah, we're talking about this exponential growth as quickly as possible. Where do you guys hope to be maybe in one year, three years? Are we talking like football field size, warehouses, bigger? I mean, yeah, where where are you now? Where do you hope to be in just a couple of years to, to try to meet some of this demand? I mean, we want to be making millions to 10 millions of square feet a year. I mean, it's a lot. But again, I, I, I can't overemphasize how much leather is actually used. And we are absolutely supply constrained in terms of being able to supply to all of our partners all of the leather all of the uh, Milo they want. I mean, what a frustrating place to be in. I mean, you've hit on this idea. It's a huge success. You're like, I just need more of it. More, 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 more. Yeah. yeah. Especially after all this time working in biomaterials and figuring out how all learning all about biomaterials and all the different you know, we've we've made and scale scaled and sold our micro silk, made scaled and sold our B silk, and now 
making and scaling Milo and Milo has the biggest demand and the honestly the biggest environmental impact potential. And, you know, I wish I wish I could just say, oh, we started exactly there. And so we'd right. be 10 years ahead. But that's not, you know, I think that's revisionist history. So we're just going to all I can promise is we're going to do our best we can to scale as quickly as possible. You know, there there is a future where one can imagine leather consumption going down if people get turned off and get so turned on by the idea of Milo that they won't buy anything else. And the leather market actually shrinking as, you know, it's it's far fetched, but you know, I can choose to be optimistic and look glass half full and say the leather market's actually shrinking, particularly as people cease to consume beef and uh, maybe cat livestock uh, production goes down, and so then may- maybe we grow a larger percentages because <laughs> um, the market the market dips for for hide, and then we can then grow the market with Milo. I don't think that's overstating the potential impact. Mm-hmm. I know that's how I felt, uh, and I know people can follow you know fashion partners to see what they're going to be making with the material. You guys do a great job putting out that information, but. You know, what are some of the early products that you're seeing being made and is this available yet? So yeah, I guess what products are being made with the material and where can people get them if if they're available yet? If you you may have seen just in the past couple of days, I don't know when this podcast will launch, uh, Stella McCartney just did a reveal of a uh, Milo based garment, not something you'd ever want to see me wear, perhaps a bit too fitted and revealing you know, I, I do exercise, but perhaps not enough. <laughs> um, yes, the black the black suit that I saw. I mean, you probably look great, but yeah, it's, it's for certain folks, certainly. Maybe um, maybe for runways only. I don't know exactly runways only. But expect uh, 2020 to be our year of our year of launches. Uh, all of that news is coming. 2020 was a a difficult year, obviously, for a lot of people with COVID from a business standpoint, when it was unclear if the world was going to pull out of sustainability in the interest of bottom of the bottom line. But fortunately for everyone involved, including humanity, all our partners were leaned into sustainability and said, this is more important than ever. And yeah. we've been very, very fortunate. So now we're, we're making up for some lost time, you know, because we have we obviously worked from home, shut down facilities for a bit, and uh, expect a lot of new news in 2021 on the Milo front. That's really exciting. We can start seeing maybe this trickle out into the consumer side of things, but it is still exciting just seeing it in that high fashion application like what you're talking about, because it is kind of a bold statement in the direction that fashion can can take now. You know, and... I don't want to skip over this. I don't know how I did, but just in terms of like waterproof durability, just to sing its praises again, I'm assuming you guys have reached something that's that's comparable to leather in terms of how waterproof it is, how durable and how long lasting it is. Yeah, everything we do in terms of hitting product specs has to do with the leather properties that and the properties of a material needed for the products our partner want to use Milo in. So right. if they if if they currently use a leather that is waterproof in that respect or strong in, in that respect, we work on the properties that, that they need for those products. Uh, we have had a very tight feedback loop and cycle between our brand partners or consortium brand partners and the Milo product development team and R&D team. Even more exciting, even more exciting. And then just to take us into the future a little bit, because I have this unique opportunity to speak with someone who works very successfully with mycelium as a material. And you're also a proper biomaterial scientist who's worked in a lot of areas of this field. What are some of the applications you see in the future for mycelium as a material? And you can limit that to kind of apparel and what you guys work in now, or maybe some of your more far out thoughts of how we can see mycelium being used you know maybe even like 20 30 50 years from now yeah you know it's it's fascinating to think about i am i am a sufficient pragmatist that i have a hard (laughs) time with the 
speculating on what these like second skin future breathable suits type stuff that you know that people like to talk about where it's like i'm gonna have a mycelium suit that's gonna have lungs and help me breathe and swim underwater (laughs) and it's gonna have but i do love to just look at materials in nature and you know mycelium aside you know you look at at cephalopods you had octopus and squid skin and those use colored pigments in their skin to give themselves structure and color such that they can camouflage both color wise and texture wise and you go wait that already exists underwater there's nothing necessarily stopping that from existing as a garment at some point if you believe that this is that all of these things are doable in the future it's not necessarily nicillium but it's another nature-based material where you go that seems too sci-fi to be true but it's already there it yeah. already exists so maybe that future then is about just peering ever more into this incredible array of materials that we take for granted all around us with insects, animals, plants, fungi, teasing apart maybe the biochemistry, the biology of how they work and trying to apply that to scale. I mean, again, that's just really exciting to think there's so much left for us to discover and pull from right here on earth. That's a future I can get behind. And then what advice do you have for people that want to get into this field? Because I know for a lot of designers, this sounds incredibly appealing, but they don't always see, you know, what job am I going to get or what, you know, so what are some, and maybe that's changing, but what's some advice you have for people that want to get involved in biomaterials, biodesign, all those kind of fields? I think what I would advise people, particularly if you're on the design side, is take a deep dive to take and take the time to look into the materials you're using. And what the impacts of those are. It's really hard and uh, to, to decipher all the information. So don't beat yourself up if it's complex. It is, there is no straightforward metric that's just like, it's better on, everything's better because of X, Y, or Z. You know, even, mm. even when it comes to landfill, you start, is it biodegradable? Is it bio, anaerobically biodegradable? Is it aerobically biodegradable? Is it degradable in salt water? Is it degradable in fresh water? It's a very hard problem. But at least if you, if you put some amount of time into understanding where your values are, is it to be vegan? Is it to not use extractive materials? So petroleum or materials that are extracted from nature that in, in particularly a non-sustainable way. So maybe leather or rubber. And design around that and try to pay as much attention you can to to greenwashing is is something being advertised as new and novel when it isn't actually and it isn't actually better for the environment and you're paying some sort of premium. It's not hard to do the research, but it does it does take Mm -hmm. some time to look into it and then experiment, experiment with these new materials. I mean, I grow mushrooms at home. I didn't, again, did not start out as a mycologist, just material scientists who love natural materials. And it's so easy to grow mushrooms at home. And it gives you a whole new appreciation for how quickly they can grow and how the material feels. And how does that feel different from some other material? And why would you like that versus others? And you can go online, you can find instructions for how to grow mycelium you can find instructions for how to grow a uh, bacterial cellulose and turn it into sheets and so there's a lot of resources for you to play around and sort of be a home scientist in biomaterials to see what you want to make with it wow that's fantastic advice to dive in get involved start working with these materials and i love you just brought up that idea of i mean you brought up a couple powerful ideas there about greenwashing, being careful not to just say something sustainable when it's not, but also this idea of not sacrificing, and I'm bastardizing probably a well-used quote, but sacrificing progress, positive progress at the altar of perfection. You know, there are so many angles to think about when we think about a more sustainable material that it's unlikely you're going to hit every single dream mark in making this perfect material that's zero, that's a complete, you know, cycle zero waste, all that kind of thing. But to make something that's going in the right direction is still is still really positive. 
So I, and of course, I wanted to know if you had already been then inoculated, working so much with mycelium, if you were now yet yeah, growing mushrooms, going out and hunting <laughs> mushrooms, uh, and it sounds like some of that's rubbed off on you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I love, I love mushrooms. It's very funny because as a kid, I couldn't stand the smell of cooked mushrooms. And then it's just one of those things that as an adult, all of a sudden it switched. I, can, I know it was the exact same smell, but it went from non-appealing to appealing, the exact same smell. And now I just, I love them. And I love looking at the different structures. They make fungi and slime molds. I love the lion main structure. Oh. And just looking at all these shapes and colors and how beautiful they are and what led these these organisms to evolve to make shapes like that and materials like that. And that's what's so exciting, I think, about the next few years as mushrooms and fungi explode in our cultural consciousness here in the West is folks like yourself, talented, intelligent people from all these different disciplines who are going to start looking at fungi and mushrooms and seeing something in there that not everyone sees. And we're going to start really pulling out all the gifts and all the potentials that mushrooms have to offer us. I think that's I think that's really exciting. Well, Dave, where can people find out more about Bolt Threads, Milo, maybe yourself? Where are the best places for people to get connected with your projects? You know, the quickest place, even though, yes, you can go to boltthreads.com, miloonleather.com. I believe it's milo-unleather.com. Um, but the quickest place is whether it's Twitter or Instagram, at Bolt Threads at Milo underscore unleather. So Milo underscore unleather or me, David N. And is it Nate? That's my middle name, Breslauer. So D-A-V-I-D-N-B-R-E-S-L-A-U-E-R. And I encourage people to go check it out. There's an amazing, I don't know if you want to call it rabbit hole or social media hole to go down and look at all the work you guys are doing, all the people you're partnering with. And like you said, there's new stuff emerging, it seems like daily. So it's really an exciting, exciting project to follow. Well, then to wrap things up, I'm going to ask you three questions I like to ask all my guests. And for someone with a background like yourself and kind of interesting perspectives, I'm excited to hear what some of your answers are. And the first one, is and maybe we'll expand the question a little bit usually it's a mushroom you love and why but you know a mushroom or a fungi that you love and why maybe it's a filamentous fungi that doesn't make a mushroom but a mushroom or a fungi that you love and why well as i said before i do have i have a fascination that i can't totally explain and i think it's mostly aesthetic with lion's mint lion's vein the icicle look just it just appeals to me in of some special way. And then it also has nutritional attributes, mental health, mental health attributes as well. <laughs> but most importantly, it looks amazing. Yeah. It looks amazing. Yeah. That's one of the most uh, entrancing mushrooms for sure. And actually one of the ones that really got me into eating more mushrooms. So a great choice. Uh, and then, you know, a broader question, and you can kind of take any direction you want with this, you know, whether it's kind of a, a spiritual connection, new perspectives on work you're already doing, but what has this intimate relationship with fungi you've developed given to you? You know, what's that imparted in you? How has that changed you? Given how widespread fungi are and how many species there are, and the fact that they can decompose so much and such a breadth of things and then grow into such a breadth of things. It's, it's this kind of constant reminder of the power of, again, the, the ecosystem and the circularity of this ecosystem. They are such a dominant force in their ability to break break structures down, break a forest down and rebuild. I find it to be sort of energizing, invigorating to think about creation from decay and being an essential part of almost natural recycling, to coin a phrase. <laughs> natural recycling. Yeah, I think fungi embody that understanding of natural systems and ecological kind of zero waste systems because they're the main players in most of it. 
So yeah, I think I think everyone can't help but kind of get that perspective embedded in you when you start paying attention to fungi. And then this is something we've talked about kind of all along the way, but maybe your aspirations or your greatest hope for what our relationship with fungi, you know, our society, our culture, maybe you could even broaden that to humanity's relationship to, with fungi as it develops. What's your greatest hope for what that will mean for the future of people and the future of our planet? You know, I I hope we can get back to that appreciation of where things come from. It's so hard in an industrialized society to lose track of where in the earth thing all the all the elements and the materials come from that make up everything we use, where even food comes from, and hoping to really bring us back to just the idea that you know we make things that we've taken or extracted or grown from nature and make them usable for ourselves and in some cases you know as we talk here on our electronic devices we mine things from nature and there is a huge aspect of that not everything is just machines that just pump things out arbitrarily or factories that pump things out arbitrarily. it comes from somewhere and it's got to go somewhere so how does that how does that all fit together and how how can we re-relate to nature based off those concepts in what we wear and how we live wow and i think the impact of that cannot be understated just that increased consciousness of that cycle industrial cycle we're taking part in how it relates to the natural world that it's kind of on top of will change everything if we get everyone there everyone at the same level of awareness as david kind of knowing what goes on behind the scenes to make these things it'll <laughs> instantly change you know how we relate to the world and the choices we make so yeah i i hope for that future as well very mm -hmm. well elucidated well david thank you so much for coming on and sharing just your experience with Bolt Threads. This work is incredibly exciting. I'm honored to have gotten some of your time and then also sharing some of your other broader, deeper perspectives. You know, it's really been an honor and pleasure to speak with you. You as well. Thank you again for having me.